Welcome, guys, to my top 10 board games for 2019. This is a great year for board games. There was a lot of solid games, a lot of social deduction games, a lot of trader games that came out this year that I really liked, uh, and, and really good party games and really good um, you know, family weight games and, and heavy games, all of them in between. Really solid year. And I have my top 10 favorite games of the year that came out, and I'm really excited to show them to you guys. So let's go ahead and get into the video. Gaming tech, eating brekkie is the gaming tech, going for a brekkie is the gaming tech, gaming techie is the gaming tech, gaming techie. Alright guys, welcome to my top 10 board games for 2019. There was a lot of good board games that released this year, and I was able to play a bunch of them for you guys this year to give you guys my overall opinions on what I thought were the best 10 games for me and the people and the, you know, the group that I play with and stuff. And my group tends to like anywhere from... You know, very simple games to party games to lightweight games to medium games. Uh, we usually don't play things that I guess are considered really, really heavy. Uh, I don't really think I have any of those in my collection that I can think of. Uh, for those of you guys wondering, you can kind of see the back shelf on what that's like. But uh, I think we play a good variety of games, um, you know, across all difficulty levels and stuff like that. And these are my top 10 favorite games of the year. And we're going to start, of course, at number 10. And the first game we're going to talk about... is Game of Thrones Oathbreaker. Now, this game is basically, if you guys have played games like um, Secret Hitler, which is a really big party game that came out basically, I believe this one is for, yeah, five to eight people. Basically, it's a trader game, or it's a, it's a trader game. There's two sides to this one. There are the Loyalist and um, and the Conspirators. And basically, you're trying to, your, your side is trying to win by raising a track on the board higher than the other, by completing missions in the game, and you pass those missions by getting people on your team to play different the cards that are for that mission to actually succeed. But if you have more people, obviously, on the other side playing in that mission that you chose to be in that mission, then you're going to have a lot of lying and a lot of bluffing and stuff because now there's going to be cards in there for the others. And you're going to be like, who the hell played those cards? I didn't play those cards. And, and, you know, there's bickering back and forth. But what makes this game stand out from the other games like Secret Hitler and stuff that are very similar to this um, besides the fact that this is a Game of Thrones, you know, uh, theme on top of it, is the fact that there is a king at the table that is actually the overseer of everything. And the king is actually the one that's going to be in there the whole entire time, actually picking people for the mission and figuring out who should go on that mission because he actually trusts them and because he's on the, on the loyalist side throughout the game. And he doesn't want to pick conspirators on, on, you know, on his side to actually, you know, manip uh, manipulate that side. So... He's trying to find the loyalist out there. He's trying to put them on these missions so they can complete them correctly. Uh, and all meanwhile, everybody at the table also has a secret objective that they're also trying to compete. So this game is a lot of fun, guys. It's one of the one of a, it's a really really good party game, especially if you're a fan of Game of Thrones. Uh, they did a really really good job. This is my favorite Game of Thrones themed game that has come out. There's been actually a few of them, and this is my favorite one. Uh, we're having a lot of fun with this one, and uh, I recommend this to anybody who likes. Uh, trader games or anybody who likes, uh, you know, the Game of Thrones theme and would like something like this with bluffing and, and lying and stuff like that, backstabbing friends and stuff. A hell of a lot of a good time. You do need five players to play at least. Like I said, it's five to eight. And that is Game of Thrones Oathbreaker, Oathbreaker at number 10. The next one at number nine is a competitive social deduction game. And we're talking about Paranormal Detectives. Now, this game is really cool. Basically, what it is is you're going to have a team of detective, detectives that are trying to figure out who killed somebody, why they killed someone, where they killed them, and all that stuff. And there's going to be a ghost among you. One person's going to take the role of the ghost, and they're going to be the one giving the clues out to people to try and get them to figure out, you know, who that person is, or why they did it, or why they killed that person, where they killed them, and all that stuff. But the, but the make what makes this game interesting is the ghost can't talk. He's always going to have these interesting cards in front of them that he's going to have to use and act in the way that the card tells him to. So some of the cards might say stuff like, um, you know, you might have to use two pieces of rope and that's how you're going to, uh, you know, tell the other people what you're trying to say. You might have to, um, let's see what other ones are there. You might have to create a word puzzle to, to show them. You might have to choose from uh, tarot cards. I have pictures on them and try to manipulate those picture cards to show other people what you're trying to say. Um, a, a lot of different variety on the cards as far as like how the ghost actually communicates to the other people. And that's kind of the, the you know, what makes this game stand out from the rest is that ghost with those different cards and how he's actually talking. Because most games are just, the ghost is just using a bunch of cards and he hands them to them and they have to figure it out. 
This one, he has cards that do different things on them depending on what the card actually says. And that's how they're actually, you know, talking to other people. So it's a crazy party game, uh, a really good competitive social deduction game. And then it's Paranormal Detectives at number nine. The next one at number eight is another social deduction game. But this one also differentiates itself because usually when you play a social deduction game, you need a high player count to be, act to be able to actually play it. And this one sets itself apart because you actually only you can play this for two to five players, and it plays well at all player counts, and that is the Grim Masquerade. Uh, and what makes this one really stand out for me in particular is that this is obviously in the um, theme of like uh, of the fairy tale characters and stuff. So you got the wolf in here, you got Little Red Riding Hood, you got Cinderella and stuff. And basically, what you're doing is just you're using, you're trying to grab these artifacts each round, and you're trying to play these artifacts and other players around the table so they can reveal information, and you can figure out who's on who. And who each player is. Because you're basically trying to do the objective that your character is trying to do. So if your character, you know, if you're Cinderella and that's the person that you are, she's going to have an objective and you're going to need two pieces of artifact, like the glass slippers, for Cinderella. And once you get those objectives, those two objectives in front of you, you're going to be the winner. But everyone else can see what you're picking up. So you need to play those in front of you while secretly not revealing who you actually are to everybody else. Because if somebody else realizes who you are, they're going to call you out and you're going to be out of the round. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, card play with each other, a lot of social deduction that you're trying to figure out who is who, and a lot of cards to manipulate back and forth, and it's a hell of a good time, like I said. It really sets itself apart because of the theme, which I really like, and also because of the fact that it only takes two to five players to actually play a social deduction game, and I can literally not think of many off the top of my head of social deduction games that you can play with as little as two players and as little as five. They usually require five to eight to be able to play these games well. And this is a great theme, so The Grim Masquerade at number 8. The next one on my list at number 7 is a game that actually had a game come out, not by the same publisher or by the same maker, last year that uh, everybody was hoping was going to be really good because they wanted to get into the theme of this movie, basically movie tying game. And the movie didn't end, or sorry, the game didn't actually end up being that good. Uh, so I skipped on it, a lot of other people skipped on it. I would have never expected that a year later we were going to have another game in that same movie tie-in. And this one actually be good. And should, and is basically what everyone hoped the first one would be. And of course, we're talking about Jaws. Now, this game is really, really unique. It's for two to four players. And a really easy game to play. It's a family style game. And it basically is cool because it actually splits the game into two halves. The first half is basically one person is the shark. And the other players are actually on an island. The shark is trying to go over there and... Uh, they're at the you know there's a big map on you and you're trying to go around the beaches and the shark is trying to go around and eat as many swimmers as possible while the people on the island are trying to you know throw barrels at the shark and, and you know end the round um the round basically that first part ends basically when a, the, the shark either collects a certain amount of swimmers or they throw two barrels at the shark when you're the other players and the more swimmers he catches the better off the shark is going to be in position for on this on the uh, second round and obviously the least he has the better position the other side is and then you flip over the board once you actually finish phase one. And now you guys are on the boat. And, and the boat, just like the iconic movie scene, that now you're sitting on the boat. All three players are moving around the boat. And the shark is over there trying to attack the boat, trying to attack the players and basically kill them off. And it's basically a fight to the death between the shark and the three players in the boat. It, may, it really makes you feel like you're in the movie. Really, really easy game to play, but a lot of solid mechanics in here. And, and like I said, really makes you feel like you're a part of the movie. This is exactly what I wanted out of a Jaws game. So much fun to play. And uh, I really like this one, guys. This is Jaws at number seven. The next one on our list at number six is actually another social deduction game. There's a lot of good social deduction games that came out this year. And they're all very different from each other from the ones that I'm talking about here today. And uh, hence why they're climbing up my list here. Um, and this one is called Detective Club. And this is for four to eight players. Uh, really easy, another family-style party game. And basically what makes this one unique is, so you're basically going to have one person that's going to have a stack of eight notebooks, or uh, up to eight notebooks, depending on how many people are playing. And you're going to look at these notebooks, and you're going to write down these clues of a word. You're going to have these certain amount of cards that kind of look like Dixit cards. And you're going to put them in your hand, and you're going to think of a word that matches between those cards. You're going to write that word down on the notebook. You're going to pass it to everyone around the table. Everyone but one person is actually going to have that word on the book. The, the one person who doesn't have it is going to have a blank notebook. And then everyone is going to basically take a hand of cards that they have and using the word that's in front of them, they're going to play one card in front of them that matches the words that I gave them. And you're going to do that around once and then you're going to go around twice and they're going to play a second card next to them about the, what the word was. And then I'm basically going to reveal 
to everyone what the word actually was. So now, of course, the person who didn't know the word already played their cards, but now knows the word. And now you have to go around the table and basically have to give a reason to everybody else at the table why you picked those two cards for the word that I just gave. So that leads to, obviously, some interesting conversation because the, the person who didn't know the word obviously was trying to peek at other players' cards that they were playing, maybe get a feel for what the word might be, and play their cards based on that. But they obviously had no idea what the word was, so now they're going to have to try and defend themselves and figure out what they could say to say, hey, this card does match this word because of this crazy thing up here, and this is what my logic was, and blah, blah, blah. And they're going to have to go in there and determine it. Because after that, everyone's going to basically vote on who they thought the actual person was that didn't get the word at all. And if they're right, they get points, and that's how people score points. And then the person who was... The givey of the word, if they were able to fool every uh, fool everyone uh, along with the person who didn't know the word, they also score points, and then, you know, whatever. Uh, points don't really matter. The whole point is that the game is a lot of fun to play, and you're trying to figure out who's who. Uh, like I said, it uses Dixit cards, so it's really easy, interchangeable if you have Dixit cards to kind of put them in this game. This game's a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, one of my favorite social deduction games of the year, and in my collection now, that is Detective Club at number six. All right, guys, the next one on my list is another cool... Um, social um, trader based game that you're going to be able to play with your friends and family and it is up to eight players that can play this one and we're talking about Obscuro. Now this one is really cool because I really like the design. You're all basically trying to exit the actual library and basically there's going to be up to seven people trying to go in there and exit the library room by room. So you have to exit the room room by room and the way you exit each room is there's going to be a grimoire around which is basically the one player who is going to be giving out clues to the rest of the table to tell them which door they actually need to exit in that room to get to the next room to finally get to the exit. But amongst all those people is, of course, a traitor. And if that tra that traitor is basically trying to make everybody not pick the right exit, obviously, make them waste time, make them not get to the exit in time, and trying to, you know, play cards and, and deter the conversation when they actually are going to the right door to deter them in a different direction. And it's really cool. I like the, the artwork that you guys are seeing. Uh, posted up here uh, on the car on the card design on the actual library and the rooms and stuff really really cool game uh, Obscurio uh, a really good party game for up to eight people like I said and it's a hell of a lot of good time another one of the good trader games that came out this year if you guys are a fan of trader games this is the the one I recommend the most of course being at my number five and that is Obscuro. The next one on my list is a simple party game that you can play with anybody it can play up to let's see how many people can this play up to up to eight players Plays really quickly in 30 minutes, and we're talking about Medium. Medium is basically a mind uh, a mind game that you basically play with a partner. So basically, let's say you have eight people around the table, and I have someone to my left and someone to my right. We're all going to have a hand of cards, and you're going to be playing on a team with the person on your right and the person on your left. Let's say it's, a team, it's my turn to play with the person on my right. We're basically both going to, I'm going to play a card first. I'm going to play it to the table, and then the, uh, my other partner is going to try and play a card that kind of has a meaning that might be able to go together, something that relates to each other on those cards. And then we're going to have two words in front of us. Let's say it's uh, field and ball, for example. Let's say those are the two words. Now on the count of three, we both, at the count of three, have to say a word that is basically going to both come to our mind at the same time based on those two words. So we both go one, two, three, and I go soccer. If the other person said soccer at the same time, then we score the, the first pile of points. If we don't, we get two more other tries to actually get it correct. And if you don't get that at all, then obviously you lose your turn and you don't score any points. You keep going around the table basically trying to read each other's mind. So it, it definitely plays really well when you're really you know good friends with, with people around the table, trying to read each other's minds and try to see what you guys come up with. And um, what's cool is that when you get those words wrong, if I said, didn't say so if I said soccer and he said baseball, now you're not using those two words at the table anymore. Now you're using soccer and baseball as your two words. Now you need to come up with a medium word that you're both are thinking about between those two words. So it really gets really hectic. And uh, like I said, a quick game to play before other games. A lot of fun. Uh, this is called Medium at number four. The next one on this list is I think a game that nobody actually thought was going to be good. I know I didn't. I saw this game come out and I was like, oh God, they're obviously just trying to cash cow because they obviously come out with figurines and everybody's obsessed with them, and now they're going to come out with a board game, and it's probably going to be terrible. And then I started hearing a lot of people who started reviewing it and started getting their copies being like, dude, this game is great. And I was like, oh, I really need to look into this now because the properties that they have in this game are interesting to me. And, of course, we're talking about Funkoverse 
basically what this is is they had different themes for all the different games. This is a strategy game for up to four players. Um, and basically, this is the DC box. They also have a Harry Potter box. They have the Golden Girls on here. And you can mix and match and basically play Golden Girls versus Harry Potter, Harry Potter versus DC, and, and all these crazy combinations. So this game is going to be infinitely expandable. I'm hoping that they release even more, you know, uh, different themed boxes uh, in the future. And basically, each one of these big boxes then comes with two uh, double-sided map that has different missions. And the map is obviously themed like this one for DC has different scenarios where you're sitting in Gotham City, or the other side is Joker's Carnival, and you basically play on those side of maps, and you have different missions. Some, some missions may be like a capture the flag kind of variant, or a team or a deathmatch kind of variant, you're using special abilities on your characters that you're controlling, and you're going around the map trying to, you know, take out the other team before they take you out, depending on what the mission is. So, this is a really, really cool game, guys. I'm really excited for how this goes forward. I'm really happy that it actually turned out to be good, uh, because I didn't think it would be when it first got announced. It doesn't play. It doesn't take that long. Anywhere from 20 to 60 minutes, depending on how fast and how easy everybody knows the rules. And I hope that they continue expanding this one. This is Funkoverse at number three. The next one on my list is another one that I also didn't actually have on my radar uh, that I kind of saw and I was like, oh, that looks interesting, but I don't know if I'm actually going to get it. And then I kept hearing over and over again how people said that this was one of their favorite games of the year. And then I was like, all right, I need to go check this game out because too many people that I follow in the board game industry are talking about how good it is. So let me go ahead and pick this up. And I'm talking about Horrified. Horrified is actually sold at Target. And sometimes when games get sold at Target exclusively, you're like, huh, I wonder if it's going to be a game that's good. But Target's actually released some really good exclusives over there lately in the last year. And Horrified is another one that's outstanding. And this is obviously in the vein. Horrified is uh, from the monsters of like the world of like things like The Mummy, Frankenstein, Dracula, things like that. And it is a cooperative game, one versus the rest of you. Uh, it's up to five people, it plays in 60 minutes, and basically one person is going to take control of the monster, and then everyone else is trying to, you know, defeat them, and obviously uh, be the heroes to defeat that monster. Each monster controls very differently, I believe there's uh, seven different monsters in this one. Another game that could, they could expand easily with different expansions with even more monsters, and you take control of the monster, like I said, they all feel very different from each other, and then the heroes, and you're trying to go around the map and, you know, uh, take out the monster and find out where they are. So this is a really cool game, one of my, definitely my favorite cooperative game of the year, uh, being the only cooperative, fully cooperative game on my list with no trade or any of that stuff that we talked about before. Fully cooperative, but one versus many. And a really cool game, a really easy game to get into if you're scared of games like I am where it's one versus many because you think that like only one person's always going to be that monster. Once people see you playing it, they're going to be like, all right, can I take a turn now and be the monster? And that's basically how the game goes. So... Really, really solid game here, guys. Uh, if you're a fan of cooperative games, this is the best one of the year that has come out. One versus many, and that is Horrified at number two. And my favorite game of the year, I don't think needs any introduction. As soon as I saw this game, I already knew this was probably going to be my favorite game of the year because I am in love with the franchise and because I know that the people who make this, uh, who the developers and the publishers who made this game always do fantastic work on most of their games. And I'm talking about Marvel Champions. This game, speaking about expandability, this game is going to be expanded for God knows, as long as it's selling, and it's selling like hotcakes, and people are loving this game, it's going to be selling like crazy. Basically, it has another fully cooperative game, so I kind of lied saying that this was the only cooperative game on my list, because I didn't want to give number one away, but this is the best cooperative game that you can play this year. It is up to four players, and everyone takes basically a superhero. The box comes with four uh, superheroes, so it could be, you could be, um, I believe it comes with Spider-Man and Iron Man, Spider-Man, Iron Man, Captain Marvel, Black Panther, and She-Hulk, so it comes with five different ones, and then it also comes with, um, it also comes with a few, uh, a couple of villains to start you off, this is basically the core box, and everybody chooses a different character, uh, you know, a different hero to be, so I could choose Spider-Man, someone else chooses She-Hulk, and then you basically set up the, the villain. And then obviously you're all trying to use your cards. You, this is a card-driven game. And you're using your cards to play on the table. Trying to beat the villain and trying to do, beat them before they actually fulfill whatever their scenario is. Each villain has their own different scenarios, their own different tactic on what they're doing around the table. They all fear vastly different from each other. Each one has its own unique challenge. Each one plays very differently. Each one literally feels like its own mini game that you're playing against each other. And, like I said, this game's going to be infinitely expandable because they're going to be coming out with scenario packs for different villains. They're obviously going to be coming out with character packs, which they already did. They got Captain America coming already. Um, 
And then they're going to be releasing core boxes every, like, I think quarterly or something like that, where it's going to be a big box expansion. So this game is going to be expanded forever. And what's cool is, is that I'm not really a fan of LCG games because I play this game with my family, with my friends, and no one else is going to buy a box but me. So me playing a game that's going to revolve around someone else buying a box and making a deck and see who could have the best deck is not something I'm into. This game basically fills the needs of both sides because basically this is an LCG, but each of the packs that you buy, whether it be it comes in here or the ones that come in the expansion boxes that I was talking about, are all going to come pre-built. So Captain America is going to be pre-built, ready to go out of the box based on his core box. And Spider-Man comes ready to go with his 40 card deck and he's ready to play. And you can use it like that forever. You can alternate character because you're going to have infinite replayability because they're going to keep coming out with more characters and more heroes to play with. And you never have to change it if you don't want to. But if you want to go down that rabbit hole and you want to craft your own Spider-Man deck and craft your own Iron Man deck, there's cards in here that you can use and manipulate and move around each other. And there will be cards that come out in the future expansions and you can manipulate them and create your own deck based on your playstyle and use those decks as well. So it caters to both audiences and I'm glad they did because I would probably would have been sad to skip this one if it was not pre-constructed decks and you only need to, you only need one core box too. A lot of these games, LCGs, you need to buy like two or three core boxes to play. One core box is perfect, uh, especially if you're just playing with family and friends and you're not going to be the one that's going to be going to tournaments or anything like that trying to make the best deck of the, in the world of Spider-Man or anything. So guys, this game is outstanding. If you're a fan of the Marvel license, go ahead and get this game. You're going to have infinite replayability on this one with all the characters and all the scenarios. And like I said, each villain feels so different from each other. I'm really having a good time with this one. I'm looking forward to this one being in my collection for a long, long time and all the expansions that are going to come out. That is Marvel Champions at number one. And just a couple of quick shout-outs for uh, some honorable mentions that came out this year. Uh, this one's a cool game. This is a uh, last one standing. It's exactly what you think. This is basically Fortnite in a box. Basically, you literally build an island, and everyone's basically using weapons and stuff to try and kill each other and be the last one standing. They're looting. It literally is Fortnite in a box. Really, really cool uh, project that they came out from Kickstarter. And then another really good party game, Finger Guns at High Noon. This one plays uh, in 20 minutes, and it's for three to eight players. Really, really easy game. You have to strategize with each other and negotiate. And then you're basically going to draw your weapon. And you're trying to survive the chaos and be the last one standing. Really, really simple game to play. Really fun game to play with your family and friends. And guys, that is my top 10 board games of 2019. I hope one of, at least some of you guys got a game from this list that you didn't know about before that you're not going to go check out for yourself. Go check out and see if it's a game that you guys like as well. If you guys have any questions about any of the games you guys saw here today, as always, leave it down below. If not, thank you guys for watching. Till next time. Tech, gaming tech, he is the gaming tech, gaming techy, gaming tech, eating brecky is the gaming tech, going for a brecky is the gaming tech, gaming tech, he is the gaming tech, gaming techy.